With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Laura Erickson. Laura is a bird watcher from Duluth, Minnesota, and she would have that be the extent of her introduction. But I know from her website and from following a lot of her previous work that she deserves a much longer introduction than that. Ms. Erickson has been a scientist, a teacher, a writer, a wildlife rehabilitator, a professional blogger, a public speaker, a video host, a photographer, and the list still goes on from there. She's also written 12 books about birds, including the bestseller titled Into the Nest, Intimate Views of Courting, Parenting, and Family Lives of Familiar Birds. And so it is that specific topic that we have invited Laura to present on tonight. Ms. Erickson, it is all yours. I'm gonna turn off my video and mute myself. Okie doke, and I will start to share screen. So as soon as I find, there. Um, I wrote this book right after I stopped working full-time at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I was the science editor for a few years, uh, but I wrote this. Mari Reed was the photo editor, and the photos in this book are so important to the book's existence that I insisted that she be the co-author because she's the one. I, I actually took a few of the pictures in the book, very few. Mari took probably about half of the pictures, but she also knew photographers. She was able to network, so she's the one who got all the, the pictures going. Uh, so this is the book. This is Mari, who was taking pictures uh, long before. I didn't even get a DSLR camera until I was, uh, until 2009. And Mari has always had just wonderful equipment and she knows how to use it. So many of the pictures on this are hers. Uh, a lot of us who are birders take birds kind of for granted without really thinking about what makes them different from us. Uh, this is me with my daughter, and this is a mother yellow warbler with her chicks. And there's some things that are quite different about us. Um, mammals bear live young, except for the monotremes, the duckbill platypus and the spiny anteater or echidna, and all mammals nurse their babies. Their bodies are what feed the babies. Birds lay eggs that hatch, and so technically you should never say a bird's birthday, it's their hatch day, or their the day the egg came out of the mother is the laying day, but they also uh, have to go and find food to feed the babies or they have to take the babies to the food. So there's some complications with that. Now we think reptiles all lay eggs, but some bear live young. Those baby snakes started out in uh, eggs that didn't really have a shell, just a membrane inside the mother. The babies emerged from the egg inside the mother and crawled out. So snakes, you can say they bear live young and have a birthday, but it's still their hatch day too. Um, so they're not mammals. They do bear live young in some species, but they um, come out on their own. Birds usually have only one functional ovary. And the reason for that is if we ovulate, if humans or other mammals ovulate two eggs at once, we can have uh, fraternal twins. Uh, if birds ovulated two eggs at once from two different ovaries, they'd end up with scrambled eggs in the oviduct. So they only um, usually have one functional ovary. And the, the follicles are what become the, the whole yolk of the egg. That's the mature ovum. And when it's ready to ovulate, you could tell this one is going to be the next one to form a chick. It 
slurps into the top of the oviduct and the sperm already have to be up there. Because if they're not, as the egg passes down, uh, this is where uh, the 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 cell um, the cells of the oviduct are secreting what's going to be the albumin, and then what's going to become the shell. And the the egg can't be fertilized when it's got all that stuff blocking the way to that single cell ovum. So it's got to be fertilized up there. And then here's where it comes out, the cloaca. Um, birds have a brood patch. They have to keep, they're warm blooded and those eggs have to stay warm. Incubated eggs of black cap chickadees, I got this from uh, Karen Cooper at the Cornell lab. Uh, the eggs, when she, when the mother was off the nest and she went in and took the temperature, they were 70 to 95 degrees. And that's when the mother's been off them for a few minutes and they lose their heat really quickly. The brood patch temperature on the mother is 97 to 108 degrees. That's the temperature of her skin. And the reason the bird that's incubating, it's in many species, just the female, in some shorebirds, just the male, and in um, some species, both the male and the female have a brood patch. And the reason they need it is because if feathers were covering that, that whole area, the feathers would be holding the, the uh, parent's heat from the eggs. So they have to lose those feathers in some species like ducks and geese. The feathers get loose but don't fall out so the mother can pluck them when she's near the nest so she can use that as nest material. But the way you look at this is you, you know, if, uh, people who've banded birds, uh, like Katie, I'm sure has seen this on prothonotary warblers, and the bander uses a straw holding the bird upside down blows and that parts the feathers. This is a black cap chickadee. And I could look at black cap chickadees all day long and take their pictures during the breeding season. And I will not see that. You have to blow the feathers to clear it so you can see it because the other feathers are long enough to cover it. The chickadee has that huge patch because it's incubating a large brood. The, uh, this I took this picture at the Cornell lab. It has nine eggs. That's about the most they lay. Once in a while, one will have 10 or 11, but it's usually nine at the most and six at the fewest, but they need a big patch. So the mother's bare skin is heating all those eggs. This is a male great blue heron, and he has a brood patch. It doesn't need to be nearly as large relative to his underside as a chickadee's because this is a large brood for a great blue heron with five eggs. Many times they lay between two and four, I think it's more normal. And all five of those eggs hatched, all five of those nestlings fledged. Uh, this was taken on a nest cam and I was just pressing save screen over and over and I lucked into that picture. So I have a picture of a great blue heron's brood patch. This is the male chickadee during the breeding season, which is the only time you can, a bander can hold the chickadee and be sure it's a male or female without actually plucking a feather and having the DNA tested like they do at Cornell. But this is called the cloacal protuberance. When the male and female mate, um, I'm sure that he has those outer feathers, that rim of feathers sticking out. I'm sure that they pull back so that this is coming in tight contact with the female's cloaca. Uh, they both have that external opening where the feces go out, the urine, which is the white part of bird droppings, is the, their, um, uh, the urates that they're excreting through the kidneys. The brown part of the fecal of the bird dropping is the fecal matter. Those go out the cloaca and the sperm in the female goes up, the sperm from the male goes out 
the cloaca. It's sort of the entry room, the vestibule to the house. But this is his cloacal protuberance bird. And here's close up. Birds do not approve of our checking their private parts, but we have to take one for the team occasionally. This is the male heron at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that I got a bazillion pictures of when I first bought my first digital camera. And I took, and he just was around all the time and I didn't notice it right away, but on his right foot, he was missing the hind toe. And on his left foot, you can't see it in this picture, but he was missing the center claw. And when they started nesting at the lab, which they had never done until 2009, um, nobody had, uh, when we looked at our close-up pictures, we could recognize him. That was before they had a cam on the nest, but we could recognize him. So he's my favorite great blue heron. Normally, great blue herons nest in heronries, which we call rookeries. The word rookery actually is from the UK with the relative of crows called the rook. And so they nested in rookeries. And in chess, the rook piece looks like a castle because rooks nest on castle turrets. And that's why. Um, you're calling it castling with the rook, it's actually a bird. But most great blue herons nest in these big colonies and they build those nests themselves. At Cornell, the pair that nested there, they were in an old white oak tree and they were territorial. And nobody knows what makes some herons choose to be territorial versus being these sociable guys but they are, but they get very, very romantic. They don't necessarily have um, a pair bond that lasts beyond the season. So they have to start all over again. And there's a lot of mate swapping from one year to the next in those big colonies. We did not have the herons at Cornell banded. We could always recognize the male. And he was there at that nest every year from 2009 until the nest collapsed in, I can't remember now if it was 2014 or 15, but he was extremely faithful. We couldn't be sure it was the same female because none of the females had those same physical features that wouldn't change from year to year. There were some plumage differences. And so we suspect some females didn't return. They either went somewhere else or died, but we have no way of knowing for sure. But they get all this romantic stuff. The male brings the sticks and the female puts them in the nest. And when I was at Cornell, somebody noticed one of the herons bringing a stick to the tree, which was right outside the lab in the pond. And you, every time someone put a cool thing on our listserv saying that somebody had spotted some bird, if you weren't checking your listserv, you knew when it happened because you would hear the thunder of footsteps as everybody ran to the window to see. And somebody noticed uh, the one here and bringing sticks. And I watched them and the male would bring a stick. This was this very old tree and it was really smooth where the limbs jutted out. And she would try to wedge it in there and it would fall into the water. They'd both lean over, watch it plop in the water. And then he'd fly off and bring a new one. And he must have brought at least 50 sticks before one finally stuck. A couple of times he got impatient with her and he was going to show her how it's done, except that each time he dropped it too. But she finally got one stick to stick and it was one with a slight, um, uh, it was like a wedge of two uh, branches or twigs uh, together and, and she wedged it in and then she got another stick. It took three or four tries before she got the second stick but then they went great guns. Uh, when you're in um, Florida, anywhere there's palm trees, herons will be one 
per palm tree at the top. And so there it's defined by how close they are to each other, where if it's uh, a lot of heronries, you can have multiple nests in the same tree. But most of my pictures of herons are of this Cornell pair when we got the nest cam on them. Um, and it was really interesting how every time when he brought a stick and she took it and wedged it in, they made it. It was very romantic. You know, you, you know, it's like buying flowers and candy and expecting something in return. It worked very well. Uh, and also every time she laid an egg, he would fly in soon after the egg was laid and uh, he would immediately fly off, bring her a stick, and then they'd mate again. And when you think about it, when the egg is going down the oviduct, uh, there can be pockets. <laughs> with... <laughs> Bye, guys. There can be pockets where the sperm is in the walls, but uh, it clears out a lot of the stuff that's in the oviduct. So they have to mate frequently between eggs to make sure there's always fresh sperm there for the next baby. That incubating patch keeps the eggs somewhere between, you know, when they're when the, uh, the mother or father is on the eggs for a, a long period, the eggs can be over 100 degrees. And that's in the rain because the rain is beating up on their feathers and but the eggs are staying dry beneath um, or it snowed a week before the eggs hatched. Uh, that year, and uh, I woke up and the cam looked like this, and it took me a moment to even figure out what the heck it was. The snow was as deep as the male's body. He had been on the nest all that night, and the mother did not come back all morning, and he just stayed on the nest every now and then. He'd stand up, and then he'd get back down again. She did not come from in early afternoon and then she was still not coming in late afternoon and finally he stood up flew off and everybody on the on the uh the cams chat room was panicking that he wasn't going to return but uh, just like three or four minutes later he flew back to the nest got back on the eggs and exactly the direction he had flown about five or 10 minutes later, the mother finally came back and took her turn so he could finally eat. But he worked hard. Uh, but this is him when he would stand up occasionally just briefly to shake off some of the water on his back. He would look down and check his eggs. Um, this is a, a herring gull, not a heron, but I want you to see that egg tooth. They have that little raspy growth on the tip of their bill. Now the baby herons, the bill is very long. And so when the baby is in the egg, it's wedged head down by the feet. The tip of the bill is by the feet. The head's at one end, the tip of the bill's at the other end with the feet. And the baby has to puncture a hole in that egg from the outside. And here you can see one has just started pipping. Once they have the hole in there, they make this, they just keep rasping to expand the hole and their bill is at the is always at the bottom so they can just kind of twist and work their way around in a circle. And little by little that end breaks off and the top of the head is here. The bill was down here. And so when they come out, we called it their little shell mitt because uh, when they tried to stand up, it was covering most of them and their head was stuck down until they could shake it off. But it was really fascinating watching these little eggs hatch. And uh, the parents were just so tender with those little guys. And when they were fishing for the babies, they have to bring the food for the babies and they would catch fish. They did not carry the fish in their bills as puffins do, they ate the fish. And they would sit on the branch of the tree without coming to the nest 
for sometimes 45 minutes before they would regurgitate. We couldn't figure it out at first why they were taking so long, but then we realized it was to make the food soft and mushy so the babies could actually eat it. It was getting pre-digested. As the babies got bigger, the parents came into the nest quicker each time. And the babies would touch their bills, the parents would watch, and then when all the babies were lined up, that's when they'd regurgitate. They, three of the eggs hatched on the same day. The parents didn't start incubating for, um, until uh, they laid three eggs. That's when they started actually heating the eggs. So those babies didn't get much of a head start over each other. So those three hatched in one day. Uh, the next day, the fourth egg hatched, and it was two or three days after that that the fifth egg hatched. We were starting to think it might ha not have a viable young in it, but all five hatched. And so three were big, and Every, all the scientists at Cornell, I had named them Mario, Luigi, and um, Princess, um, the pair, the ones we'd had back when I was still at the lab and we didn't have the cam. And then there was a fourth bird, and I named that one um, Yoshi. And everybody was telling me, don't get attached to the birds because there's siblicide in great blue herons. Well, there's a lot of siblicide in great egrets, but virtually none in great blue herons. The bigger ones got the lion's share of the food and they were very fast at grabbing food, but they never hit each other. They just were in a big hurry to get it themselves. And the parents, we could see with the cam, they would wait until all five babies were paying attention. And every time, they regurgitated closest to the two tiniest babies. So they'd at least get something before the other three came in and gobbled just about all of it up. And uh, the, the fifth baby took much longer to fledge, but it ended up fledging too. Uh, as the babies got bigger, both parents could sometimes be there. They, the babies would stimulate the parents like that, but the parents did not regurgitate into the baby's mouths. They always regurgitated onto the floor of the nest, and that's where the babies grabbed their food. But this is how the babies were trying to stimulate the parents to vomit for them. And at this point, the dad had been off fishing. He came straight to the nest. So he regurgitates a pile of fish. The one that he had eaten last was at the top of his stomach. So when he vomited the pile out, that was the first one in the nest and all the others were on top of it. So the babies cleared out all those other fish and they came to the last fish, which was a, a big carp, a big goldfish. And when the baby touched it, it wiggled. It was still alive. And the babies all got shocked and just lurched back. And when they would touch it, it would move again. And it was so freaky. They had never realized that food could be alive. And they would not, they did not know what to do with a live fish. And they just were shocked and the dad had to touch it and drop it and say, see, this is real food. And one baby tried to eat it and it moved again. And the dad picked it up and dropped it again. And finally, one of the babies um, actually swallowed live food. And that was a whole new experience that none of them had imagined. It was really fun. And the parents were so steadfast. When it was sunny, they would shade the babies for hours, especially at midday. And they would just loaf on the nest preening and stuff, but they'd keep their wings open to keep the baby shaded. And little by little, the baby started fledging. We never saw the parents feed the babies away from the nest. They always had to be on the nest before the parents would feed them. So at that point, uh, the last two and then the last one were getting much more food. So they were all catching up. He was watching us watching him, apparently. 
Um, mallards are totally different. Uh, the word mallard, M-A-L-L, -L, comes from um, the old French that means masculine or male. And the A-R-D is pejorative, like drunkard or sluggard, because mallards epitomize the worst of masculinity. The males will mate with anything that will hold still long enough to let them. And so the females are extremely selective about which male they choose. They're hoping he'll protect them from the other males. Uh, the males have all these really cool things and the female wants a male who focuses on her rather than just showing off in front of all the other males. But mallards do a, a lot of this displaying that they don't even need to have a female around. Uh, they just are big on and they mate in the water. And he actually has not just the little cloacal protuberance, but an actual long intermission organ, uh, organ that inflates when he's ready and then goes back in when he's not. She lays a lot more eggs than a heron does. Birds that nest on the ground uh, their babies, their eggs, and then chicks are very vulnerable in the nest. So most ground nesting birds have precocial babies that can already follow the mother or both parents or just the father if they're some of the shorebirds. And uh, they have to be able to be safe off the nest walking around. So they're what we call precocial and uh, ducks are very precocial and uh, the mother keeps the babies near her. It's so sad when you're watching baby mallards from day to day if you're covering the same pond frequently because when they're tiny, there could be 11 or 12 or 13 or once in a while even 14 little tiny babies following the mother. But day after day after day, as the babies are getting bigger, they're also getting fewer. And that's because of fish and turtles and all kinds of dangers that find baby ducks adorably uh, tasty. Um, shorebirds have a similar thing. The babies have to be very uh, precocial, able to leave the nest. And the parents um, very often, especially the ones that nest up in the Arctic, it's the father who takes care of them. Sometimes the mother leaves. With piping plovers, uh, both parents take care of the babies, but the mother leaves, especially in years when spring was difficult. She'll leave sooner because she was the one who did all the incubating. And so her body is depleted. Uh, no, they both incubate, but she's the one who produced those four eggs and that depleted her. So she's got to um, hightail it out of there. But this is an endangered species. So I was lucky to get these pictures two years ago in Maine. Um, uh, it's you know, if you have a good telephoto, you never have to get close up because they put these big enclosures around um, the nest, but you just crop away. And so it looks like I was right there, but I was uh, on the far side of the enclosure. But this was the only time I've ever gotten to see baby piping plovers, and it was the day that they hatched or the second day after hatching. And so they were very fun to watch and they followed both their parents and both their parents they could hover under. This one, you could see some little legs right here because one baby's tucked under already and the other two are snuggling in. And you can also see the vascular tissue under the wing here. When they're crowding in, it could be windy and cold on a main beach in June. And this is hot, bare skin. So it's like a brood patch under the wing where the, the most vulnerable part of the babies, their heads can be warmed up. So you can see the attraction sticking by the parents, but they're adorable. Now, hawks build their own nest. If you're a raptor, one of the big challenges is finding a mate 
you can trust that will first of all not kill you, not forget for a moment while you're actually tightly together. You don't want that bird to forget even for a second that you are his mate, not his lunch. So uh, they have all kinds of rituals to make sure they can trust each other. A lot of them involve flying displays or just all kinds of things that make them uh, sure that their mate can be trusted. With migratory hawks, they return to the same nest very often, and so they end up with the same mate year after year after year. Nobody knows for sure how emotionally bonded bald eagles are or whether what they're emotionally bonded to is the nest and they can't work out a property settlement, so they stay together. Um, nobody knows, but they very much end up together year after year and the trust they have is that first off uh, they won't hurt each other while they're mating and that's probably why the female who is in the more vulnerable position with hawks and owls in almost all of those species the female is bigger than the male. And then the accipiters, which are the ones that are most keyed in on killing birds to eat them, uh, the female is much bigger than the male because she's the one on the bottom. She has to be able to stay alive. After red-tailed hawks are done with their nests, uh, very often uh, great horned owls take over that nest. Owls do not build their own nests except some burrowing owls make their own burrows, but um, owls will take over a used nest and they lay their perfect little eggs, which turn into perfect little birds. Great horned owls uh, tend to stay on the same hunting territory year round and they're actually devoted to their mates. Um, often in the non-breeding season, you'll hear a pair hooting back and forth. The male is smaller, but he has the deeper voice because his syrinx is larger, his vocal apparatus. So he has the larger instrument, even though he's got the smaller body. So if you're hearing a you know which is the male and which is the female because he has the deeper voice. And so that way you could tell if you have a pair or if you have two territorial birds of the same sex because they won't have different pitches. Hummingbirds are like mallards in terms of their pair bond being not a very sturdy one, but where the male mallard will stay with the female during the time she's laying eggs. When she starts incubating, he goes off because now she's totally lost interest in um, any kind of romance. But hummingbirds don't even make that kind of a pair bond. They stay with their mate for minutes. And right now, this is the map from today on the Journey North website. Ruby-throated hummingbirds are just starting to come through and you guys get them right away. I'm way up here. So it'll be into May before we see them. Uh, female hummingbirds build the nest and incubate the eggs. And think about the challenge here. She lays exactly two eggs. And each of those eggs is going to grow into a bird that is her size. If it's a male, a little bit smaller, because hummingbirds are another species where the female's larger than the male. But the nest has to be small and tight enough that none of her heat is leaking out the sides while she's incubating. But it's got to accommodate two babies who are each going to be her size. So she has to construct the nest out of materials that will stretch so it can go from an incubator and a bassinet into a crib into a big kid bed because the babies aren't going to leave there until they can fly. 
So uh, what does she use to achieve that? She can't interweave sticks or tiny twigs because they're uh, too hard. They can't stretch. She, what she does is uses tiny bits of lichen and mosses woven together with the stretchiest material a bird can find, spider silk. And so you can watch the nest grow. Uh, one egg hatches one day and then the second egg hatches. She's the one who feeds the babies. She does not feed them just nectar. Hummingbirds are eating way more insects than we're aware of if we're just watching them at our feeders. And she's a regurgitator agitating into each of their mouths a slurry of her stomach contents, which include uh, flower nectar, sugar water, if there's a feeder handy, and lots and lots and lots of little tiny insects, which are what those babies need to grow. And she is really good at feeding them, and they're growing, and now the nest has to start stretching. Um, Watch this nest grow. She has to build a whole new nest for each brood because it starts out nice and tight with these tiny little babies. But as they start growing, the nest walls start thinning out because it's stretching. This is all the same nest. And see how much bigger the nest is now? The babies are moving in there and they're just stretching it out by their movements. And now the nest is kind of lopsided. And and it doesn't even look like the same nest anymore. And then one fledges and the next day, the next, the other one fledges. And that does not look like the nest it started out with. Woodpeckers have a special challenge. They nest in tree cavities, and the cavity is pretty deep. We just see the hole, but behind that hole, inside the tree, is this whole ginormous chamber, and the eggs are at the bottom of it. And when a parent flies in or out, you get a little bit of a current of air, but a lot of times the air gets pretty stale in there and uh, carbon dioxide starts building up. So the male is the one who incubates by night. Uh, both of them take turns during the day and because it, they get so little fresh air in there during the time they're incubating, the eggs hatch out way less, the chicks are way less developed than almost any other kind of bird. And it's so they can hatch out as soon as possible. Now when the parents come to feed them, going back and forth, uh, those babies will get fresh air. And little by little, this is a downy woodpecker nest and the parents are feeding them. And just look at that. Um, this is from a book by Stan tequila and um, I have no idea how he took these pictures whether this was um, a nest with like plexiglass or how he set it up to be able to take these pictures but the babies all survived and fledged they also well, they'll use birdhouses a lot for uh, when something steals their roost hole, but they hardly ever nest in them because they don't get enough space. Flickers, um, they do all this romance right out in the open on telephone poles or branches. They lay a lot of eggs and they're, they have these very unformed babies who all have to grow really quickly. And notice how long their necks are. Uh, that probably is helping them get closer to the fresh air. And when they can, they start climbing the walls of their nursery to get fresh air that way. I raised two baby flickers one year when I had my rehab license and they don't even tr they're not like baby blue jays and robins where they'll hop around at this point. They just, they were nestlings and they don't leave the nest ever until they can fly strongly so that they have a chance of getting back to the nest. So 
I could just stick them on a towel on a chair. And when I came back, that's where they'd be. And um, they eat regurgitated food from the parents. So I fed them with a, an eyedropper. Uh, in the nest, they stick their heads out a lot and that's how their bodies start producing vitamin D. So I would have to take mine for walks and I'd just stick them on my shorts and go for a walk and they were fine. But like I said, when they can fly, they're powerful flyers with their first flight and they were still dependent on us. But our house, we don't have a single room where a flicker can beat its wings three times without colliding with a wall or a window. So at, at the point where they could make their first flights, they had to be outside. So every time we fed them in the house, we whistled. So when we released them, if we whistled, they knew it was us and they would fly to us for feeding. And when they both came in, you had to go very quick from one to the other because they would go for each other's eyes with that bill. They were like wicked to their siblings. It was pretty bizarre. But um, I throw in some red-bellied woodpeckers because they nested in my yard and my red-bellied woodpecker nest was the very first ever reported in my county in Minnesota because we're at the northern end of their range and when we first moved here we weren't in their range but so I have to show you show off my red-bellied woodpecker nest pictures and there's one of their babies. Uh, blue jays are one of my favorite birds. Um, they are so bonded with their mates and they stay with their mate for life. They usually have a clutch of five. And one of my, um, Mari took this picture. One of my friends took a picture of a female on the nest. And the moment he clicked the camera, she flew off and pecked them hard on the head and drew blood. Um, they're very protective. And both, uh, only the female incubates, the male brings her food, just like with crows, but then uh, they both feed the babies. And this is how Mari got her pictures, because why she didn't get her head pecked at was she set this up with a remote control so she could be far away from it. So when the birds came in, she could take their pictures. Uh, but baby blue jays are so adorable. I had an education bird for um, quite a few years, but uh, the parents are just so devoted to these little guys, feeding them. And I finally got my own pictures of blue jays feeding babies in the wild in my backyard last summer because I was stuck home during the pandemic. So this is these pictures are thanks to the pandemic. Orioles build a very complicated nest. Um, the female does most of the construction. And once she's got the outer part, she builds a lot of it while she's actually inside the nest doing the weaving and making sure it all conforms to her body because she's going to have to be incubating the eggs in there. And I lucked into this. I was leading a field trip in Duluth and this was right off a path while we were watching it. So I just put my camera on video and was not planning on this. So it um, it isn't, I'm not the steadiest holder of a camera, but, but it was all pretty interesting. Mari, most of their nests are too high to do this sort of thing to. And so Mari, when she had them in her yard, she set up this platform um, that she, uh, you could see her at the top taking pictures. And this was the nest she was photographing. She's not that close to it. That's why she wants a nice long lens so she can get pictures like this. And when the babies fledge, you could tell it's a baby by that short little tail and it's still growing in feathers on its face. And my friend Paula got these in her backyard in Ohio. Oh, he's begging. Oh, it's like I can show it there. They make these high-pitched sounds 
and keep calling and hope that their parents will come and feed them. And sometimes parents manage to feed both, but a lot of times they'll feed one and then that one won't be quite so hungry next time. So the next one will get the food. But they're, uh, baby, uh, the insects that they feed them get goopy, so that's why the parents have to spend a lot of time uh, cleaning their beaks. The birds you're hearing, if you can hear the sound, I don't think it's playing it, but uh, you can hear house sparrows, because this is a backyard right outside Cleveland. Uh, the last bird nesting up where I am is the goldfinch. They um, take advantage of both the nutritional and um, architectural properties of uh, milkweed down and thistle down. Uh, they can use the soft thistly soft part to weave their nest while they eat the actual seeds and feed their babies regurgitated seeds. So their nests are so tightly woven that if, if uh, the mother isn't on the nest during a rainstorm, it can actually fill with water. And they're very devoted parents. She does all the incubating as with uh, many songbirds, and but they both feed the babies. And they, I've read that they're like the true vegans of the bird world, except that one time I was at a restaurant in Wisconsin and there were two uh, goldfinches plucking all the mayflies out of some spider webs along the building. So they're not, sometimes they cheat but they really are the true finches. That is the crossbills, purple finch, goldfinch, um, are as close to vegans as birds get um, with feeding. Uh, they, they do, some species like evening grosbeaks will feed their babies lots and lots and lots of spruce budworms when they're available, but these are the birds that can feed them regurgitated seed, especially the crossbills uh, can nest in winter because if there's a good uh, cone crop, they can feed the babies um, regurgitated seed and they can grow. Cardinals are not true finches. They feed their babies insects primarily. Female cardinals sing a more complex song than males, but the males get all the publicity for it. This is Women's History Month, so it's really nice to see that um, a lot of ornithologists are starting to pay attention to the function of females singing too. But they get very romantic right before their breeding season. She's picking a mate based partly on what, what a good provider he is by him bringing her lots of food. And they lay their egg, she lays the eggs. She's the one who incubates and he feeds her on the nest. And some of her, the function of her songs is to tell him when she needs food. And here's the little babies and stuffing food in their mouths. Look at their little mouths. Do you see these backward little things, these little projections at the bottom of their mouth? That is to keep the food, once it gets in there, uh, as the babies are still developing their throat muscles, that's to help keep the food down. But they're so cute and so insistent. They don't wear lipstick until they grow up, so that's how you identify the babies. And I have to throw in this picture because I took it when I was uh, in Ohio at the McGee Marsh, so I threw those in. And I'm ending with the black-capped chickadee because that's my personal favorite bird and because I have the most pictures of them. They're the Norwegian bachelor farmers of the bird world. Chickadees never, ever sleep with other chickadees except when they're babies in the nest and when they're the, uh, the mother uh, brooding the babies until they have enough feathers that she doesn't have to sleep 
in there anymore. Uh, they, we had a night where it got to 40 below in Duluth this winter. And back in, I think it was 91, I don't remember for sure. No, it was later than that. But we had a night in Tower, Minnesota, when it got down to 60 below zero Fahrenheit. And uh, chickadees, every one of them slept by themselves in their own little cavity that night. And they all were fine. Um, Can you hear that? That's a chickadee's heartbeat. David Sibley was watching a chickadee get banded and he put his cell phone record, uh, on record, on voice recorder, uh, uh, against the chickadee's back and recorded that. And when I heard it, I converted it as a WAV file to the WAV form. And so you can actually count the beats per second. And um, that bird, it was handheld, so it was stressed, but its heart was beating 877 beats per minute, which is pretty amazing and was more than anybody had recorded before he got this recording. So that was pretty cool. But chickadees can make their own cavities. Now I'm talking about black cap chickadees, you guys have Carolina chickadees down there, but I don't, don't have any good pictures of Carolina chickadees, so you're stuck with black caps. They can build, they can excavate their own holes, or they can use birdhouses. This is the kind Cornell uses. Uh, it's PVC pipe. They can uh, take the top off and take it off the pole to when they want to weigh and measure the babies and put it back up again. Um, and they have plans that you can use. Uh, they found that chickadees are most likely to use a birdhouse or a cavity if you fill it with sawdust of some sort so that they're like the Bob Vila's of the world. They want to feel like they did it themselves, like they were the constructors. So. Um, but they build a nest inside the cavity, unlike um, uh, woodpeckers, and they use all the soft stuff they can get. I was just walking in sapsucker woods, and I never saw the dead rabbit, but there was rabbit fur, and this chickadee was getting it. One time I watched a tufted titmouse uh, flying to the middle of a busy road and plucking fur off a dead squirrel off its tail and fly off with it in a busy road with traffic. Uh, they need soft stuff, so they get it however they can. And some people offer nest materials like that. This is what their nest looks like in the cavity. Uh, and um, uh, this one has six eggs. And when they hatch, uh, they weigh about one gram. And a lot of times all of the babies in a clutch make it and the parents feed them lots of bugs. They, the food goes in and then the, and the babies make a big production right before they poop. So the parents will, and they swallow their food and then they waggle their tail and the poop comes out and the parents can carry it away. It's in a membrane. Uh, what they call a fecal sac. So it's like disposable diapers. So the nest stays shockingly clean for having all those little babies in. And um, so, and here's the little babies inside the nest. And they're so adorable and winsome when they're begging for food. This is the bedraggled parent. Here's the baby begging for food. The babies will be in perfect plumage when they leave the nest, but the parents look really frazzled. And um, this male, this is right before he's molting. He looks like he's at death's door, but he's singing right outside my window, a perfect song. That's why his mouth is open. And he looked like he was at death's door, but they molt soon after that. The babies look adorable on the other hand. And I'm ending with this chickadee who had a, a really badly overgrown beak, but he also 
had a deformed foot where he was missing three toes and he was coming to me for mealworms and he made it through the winter and in the spring that overgrown beak broke off and uh, this is him the next year. And you could still recognize him by those missing toes. But he, you, I, I don't think his bill was uh, good enough to make his own hole, but they used an old downy woodpecker hole and raised babies. And I got pictures of their babies and the mother was fine, but the father, you could recognize, uh, this is the mother because she has all, all of her front toes and this is her at the nest. Here's the male, he only had the one good foot and so the other foot would be drooping behind like here when he's going to the nest but they were coming in and out feeding the babies and the babies were so adorable these are all their babies and the last day I saw at least three had fledged already and these were the last two and it reminded me of these guys they didn't want to leave they were a little scared so they were thinking about it, but just like those guys could do it, so could this little guy. And that's the last of my pictures. And so that is the end. And it's kind of late, but I'll stick around. And I'm sorry it took me so long. No need to apologize. Uh, we can, I don't need to cut it off. So if anybody has questions that they wanna drop in, we can stick around um, for a little bit longer. One question that already did come in was asking about, uh, let's see, so she was saying that her neighbors have been chopping down their old trees and which had a lot of great cavities supporting red-bellied woodpeckers. And so do you recommend anything to provide for housing for red-bellied? I don't know if red bellies use birdhouses. Uh, they're very rare up here still. And so I haven't had too many opportunities to um, watch them except in my yard. And there they made their own cavity. Um, but it's worth getting, you know, uh, they're way too big for a bluebird house, but a wood duck house might work. And if it doesn't work for them, it might work for somebody else. You don't wanna to set too many bird houses out, uh, particularly if you're like trying to attract chickadees, you're gonna have problems with house wrens, uh, which are like wicked evil for pecking other birds' eggs apart. Um, but it's so, so uh, tricky to be helping without, providing the wrong kind of help. You want your backyard to be a source of baby birds, not a sink where parents come there, lay their eggs, and then something bad happens. So um, so you want to find, but it's heartbreaking when people feel the need to get rid of their big old trees because they provide a lot of value for a lot of reasons even beyond what birds need. And I desperately want to come back to Louisiana. I have never, I'm embarrassed to admit it, I have never been to Baton Rouge. I spent about three weeks in uh, New Orleans and there about after the BP oil spill, but I've never been to Baton Rouge and um, I really want to come there. And now I want to see prothonotary warblers there. Like, come anytime. I will show you prothonotaries. And if you come during the breeding season, pretty easy. <laughs> so, sorry that, so sorry that you didn't get to come last year. And please, we have an, you have an open invitation. So anytime you want to come, come on down. Laura Erickson, well, if you've met Jane Patterson, if y'all were previously corresponding. Jane is our the president for the Baton Rouge Audubon Society. Um, can you recommend cameras for beginning birding photographers at a, ooh, it scrolled up on me, at a lower price point, maybe in the thousand dollar range? Um, what I started with before I got my first DSLR was what they call an extended zoom camera. 
um, and uh, you don't want you don't want to get the little kind that'll fit in your pocket because the lens is nowhere near big enough to let in enough light in natural conditions for a lot of bird things. And also, you don't want to use a digital zoom because it'll pixelate your birds too much. Uh, but um, Canon and Nikon and Sony make some pretty good cameras under a thousand that ha you know that can zoom um, pretty well. And they, the technology keeps improving. Uh, you, the, you want as big of a lens as it can be um, as far as how, how much glass there is. It's like with binoculars, uh, that second number, 7 by 42 or 10 by 50 or 10 by 32, that second number tells you how many millimeters across in diameter, uh, your outer lenses of your binoculars are, the bigger they are, the more light they gather. And that's really important with photography too. The bigger that lens, the more light you're gonna get. But um, I got pretty good at using my just extended zoom when I went on trips. And that was getting me in the habit of watching the birds, following them, taking the picture in time, uh, getting quick at focusing. So when I could afford an expensive camera, when I finally got an actual paying job at Cornell for those years, um, I uh, was better at using it. So I'd recommend an extend, you know, an extended zoom to start with. And it looks like maybe Derek added a specific recommendation in the chat too, if you guys want to. And other people have their preferred or their favorite cameras that they've been using. Um, so Panasonic, Lumix, DMC, FZ80 has a good zoom. And then Jane added that, and presumably what she's using, the Nikon P900 or the P950. I'm embarrassed to say that when I finally did have the money to blow on a camera, I didn't do a lot of comparison shopping. That was while I was working at Cornell and everybody had Canon. And when, uh, when one person starts getting good pictures, everybody else wanted to get that camera. And once you buy a camera, and then get a lens. If you upgrade your body, you have to stick with that brand because otherwise your lens won't fit on it. And it just, so it's not like Canon is better than Nikon. It was just like random chance that the first person to get a camera there got Canon. And so everybody did. Um, but I've been happy with Canon. Of course, now uh, I just upgraded yesterday my new camera came uh, to their R5, which is a mirrorless one. And um, so pretty soon the, um, uh, the DSLRs are going to be a thing of the past, but that means people who want to get one will be able to get one cheaper. <laughs> and then anybody who wants to upgrade and sell me theirs, <laughs> there should be some sort of camera exchange and hand-me-downs. <laughs> Um, Laura, I was curious for, and I know it's probably variable for some of the species, but I didn't realize quite how underformed or underdeveloped the woodpeckers are whenever they first hatch, since I hadn't seen a lot of woodpeckers in the nest. So how long were some of those species actually incubating eggs? Uh, the incubation um, is, is like, uh, uh, 10 days uh, for even fairly big ones, 10 or 12 days. Uh, I'd have to look it up to be precise, though. I'm not exactly 100% mm -hmm. sure. Just, but yeah, they just have to minimize it because, you know, and they probably spend more time off the nest just so they can keep breathing. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a tricky it's so interesting. The more you know about birds, the more complicated it gets and the more fun it gets to find out all the things you don't know. 
but uh, it's so logical in a way how, you know, there, you look at that deep, deep nest and realize that the air exchange is really crappy down there and suddenly it makes sense why, oh, that's why. The last question that just came in, is the brood patch strictly for incubation on the nest? Yes, and uh, it uh, the brood patch is not present most of the year. It's present when um, the bird is going to need it. And so those feathers loosen, that's a hormonal response that the feathers get loose and either fall out or are loose enough for the mother to pluck. Um, and uh, when they're, by the time the babies are, you know, fledging, um, the brood patch is pretty much grown over again. So banders have a narrow window of time each year when they can be certain when they ban blue jays and chickadees and other birds. A lot of the birds that mate for life um, and where both parents do the work, uh, have identical plumage between the male and female. There isn't sexual dimorphism. But there's other birds, you know, you learn all these rules like, uh, you know, the only the male bird sings because he doesn't incubate. And then you find out that, well, male rose-breasted grosbeaks have very gaudy plumage and the males sometimes sing on the nest. So that's very counterintuitive. All right, but nobody has any more questions. I mean, I agree, it's so fascinating. And I know we could have you back again in the future <laughs> for more on this topic and so many others. Thank you so very much for joining us this evening. Well, thank you so very much for having me. Um, good night, everybody. We will have our next brass presentation the second Thursday of April, so April 8th. And that one is gonna be about famous birders and their foul obsessions. So famous people that you will have known about, but maybe didn't know that they were obsessive birders in some form or another. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jane. Thank you. Good night. Good night, thanks so much for having me. Sure.